Finally, after 30 years, JavaScript dates are getting fixed. No more mutability issues, no more month zero, no more time zone chaos, way better passing and multi-calendar support. I'm talking about the temporal proposal, which is starting to be shipped in experimental releases of browsers, indicating that it could be ready soon. So let me show you why Temporal is awesome and some of its most powerful features like duration, they are super cool to work with. So at the moment I have Temporal polyfilled via a package, but imagine one day this will be a JavaScript global, just like the date object. Let's start out by looking at temporal.now, which as the name suggests, is how you get the current date and time in a range of different formats. Now is also the best time to subscribe to the channel. We need to decide what format that is that we want then. As you can see, there's quite a few. There's seven that we'll be going through, but let's just start out with the instant type. Temporal.instant is the UTC time, or more accurately, the Unix epoch time. And the difference this actually has over the JavaScript date object is that it offers nanosecond precision. So if I expand it over here, you can see I can get the epoch nanoseconds as well as those epoch milliseconds. Now, the other really cool behavior about the temporal instant type is if I go ahead and console log this to a string here, you actually get out the ISO formatted string. So this is super nice when you're working between your front end and back end, you just want to deal with UTC time and none of that time zone nonsense. So for all of the temporal types that we'll take a look at, temporal.now is how you'd get the current date and time, but if you want to choose a different point. Well, to do this, we can just get rid of the now there and we can go ahead and call the temporal type itself. And then we can use dot from. Now this is where that better passing support comes in. With temporal or instant, I can actually just provide this with a date time string. But in some of the others we'll look at, you can provide it with a string or an object as well to construct it. But the key here is you need to pass it enough information. So with temporal instant, it needs to have the time zone information. If I go ahead and just delete the time here, you'll see it's going to throw an error and it says it requires a time zone offset. If I go ahead and add back the time, but I remove that Z at the end, which indicates it's a UTC string, you can see we're gonna get the same error. So we need to either provide that Z to say it's UTC or the specific offset. So if I go ahead and add in a minus one offset here, you can see it correctly converts that back to UTC with the offset. The other choice you do have for instant though is you can actually craft this from the milliseconds or nanoseconds. You can either do that via an object here by passing it like this, or you can actually just change the dot from here to instead of saying dot from, you can say dot from epoch and then nanoseconds or milliseconds. So instant is quite straightforward. So let's go ahead and look at some of the other temporal types. And we'll start out with the one with the most information, and that is actually going to be the zoned date time. So if I say temporal dot zoned date time here and then dot from, and we can pass this some information. Now I've gone ahead and provided it with an object this time instead of just a string. And going forward, you can actually do that with all of the rest of the temporal types. It can either be a string or you can construct an object with the information. Now the zoned date time type is actually a time zone aware, calendar aware date time type. It's actually just the instant type, but then it has the time zone information and also optional calendar information. The calendar information is because temporal actually supports a range of calendar types like Gregorian, Islamic, Hebrew, and Chinese. Just like the instant type, the zone date time does need enough information to know what time we're talking about. So if I went ahead and just removed the time zone here, you'd actually see that it would throw an error and say that time zone is missing and it is required. But if I go ahead and just delete the hour here, it will happily make an assumption that I just mean midnight. And you can see in here, if I go ahead and see what the hour is, it's just hour zero. Now this is another really cool thing about all of the temporal types going forward. They actually have so much information that you previously would have calculated using a library. You can see on the object here, we have the month code. We have all of the usual things that we'd expect like the day, minutes, hour. But then we can also go ahead and get out the epoch nanoseconds on this one. We can get the day of the week out. We can get the week of the year. We can get the year of the week. We can get how many days there are in a week, a month, a year, and we can even get if it's in a leap year. So this is super nice behavior that you previously would have had to make a calculation for yourself, or you would have jumped for a library like Moment or Luxon. The other really nice thing that all of these temporal types offer you is a way to convert between them. So if we just say now and then two, you can see I can convert this to all of the other temporal types like the plain date there, plain year month, and all of the others. We go ahead and just log this out to a string though to see what it looks like. As you can see, we go ahead and we get the year, the month, the day, the time, and then we also get the offset and then the time zone names. So as I said, it's the most informative temporal type we have as it gives you the offset, the time zone name, and then it can also give you the calendar name as well. Now, the other really powerful thing about temporal types, though, is the safeties that it gives us. First, we can get some overflow safety. So what happens if I go ahead and put in month 13 here? We can see by default, it goes ahead and it uses constraints. So it will constrain it to the nearest in range, which in this case is 12. 
but you can actually customize that behavior. If I go ahead and pass in options as the second argument here, you can specify an overflow option. Now this is going to have two choices on it. It's either going to be constrained, which is the behavior we just saw and the default, but you could also choose reject, which is super nice. Essentially, it's gonna throw an error if it's out of range. The second powerful protection this gives us is called disambiguation. This is perfect for handling time zone issues like daylight saving times. So when a time doesn't exist on a specific date because the clocks roll forward, or if it occurs more than once because the clocks roll backwards. So in this example, I have November 5th, 2023 at 1.30 a.m. This actually occurs twice in New York because the clocks roll backwards at 2 a.m. So we can control which 1.30 a.m. we actually meant. So you can see here by default, it says that it is 1.30 a.m. with a four hour offset in America slash New York. If we go ahead and pass in some options though, like disambiguation, we can choose to reject compatible earlier or later. We go ahead and select earlier. Now that was actually the behavior that it was currently following. You can see that we still get 1.30 a.m. with a four hour offset. So let's go ahead and choose later. This is going to select the second 1.30 a.m. And as you can see, it's 1.30 a.m., but it now has a five hour offset, indicating it's actually a different time because of the clocks rolling backwards. We can also choose compatible here though, which just follows what JavaScript date object currently does, which is it chooses earlier when the clocks roll backwards. And then if the time doesn't exist because the clocks rolled forwards, it's gonna choose the next valid time. So it would jump from something like 2.30 a.m. to 3.30 a.m. So you can see here in our string, it's gone back to that four hour offset. And then the final option we have is actually reject. And that's just going to go ahead and throw a range error when it has multiple instances of a time that's found or if the time itself doesn't exist. So Temporal gives us some really powerful options there to handle those tricky areas with dates like daylight saving times. As I said, zone date time is going to be its most complex type as it has to have that time zone information. So let's go ahead and take a look at the other types now. Now, all of these are actually prefixed with a plane. Plane essentially just means that it doesn't have any associated time zone. It's essentially the wall clock time or the local time of the system. All of these work the same way as the temporal types that we just saw. So if I want to go ahead and craft a plain date time here, I can just say temporal dot plain date time and then dot from, and then I can give this a date string or even an object. Now, one thing to note about the plain date times is again, we don't actually need to have all of the information. If I got rid of the time here, you can see it's gonna make an assumption that it's midnight. The other thing as well, as I said, with plain, you don't have any time zone information. So you can see it's just a very simple string here. We have five plane types and they're all very self-explanatory. The name is exactly what you'd expect. So let's say we just wanted the plane date. We don't need any time information. We can go ahead and just use dot plane date here. You can see it just gives us out the date string. If we wanted the time instead of the date, we can say plane dot time. You can see it gives us the time without the date. Then we can also drop down and we can say if we want the year and months, we can say plain year month. And again, as you'd expect in the name, that's gonna give you the year and the month. And then the final option we have is actually the month and the day. And again, self-explanatory names, it gives you the month and the day. So that's the rest of the types that we need to go through. So let's move on to some of the more powerful stuff, which is how we actually work with these dates and what I think is one of the coolest additions, which is temporal dot duration. Here I've made two durations using a similar syntax to how we did for the other temporal types with that dot from. And as you can see, I can do the same thing here. I can provide an object or also a string. So this duration one is one hour and 30 minutes. And then duration two is two hours and 30 minutes. This syntax, if you haven't seen it, is actually an ISO string for a duration. The P here just means a period of time. And then you can go ahead and use the year, month and day. And then the T is the time. And then we have two hours and 30 minutes. The ISO string is actually what you get back if you do any duration to string here. You can see I've done duration one dot two string, and then we get the period of time and that is one hour and 30 minutes. So what can we actually do with our durations? Well, pretty much all of the temporal types that we just looked at have a load of methods on them to do calculations. First, we can add and subtract from the temporal types using our duration. So to keep this simple, I have January 1st as a plain date, and you can see I've got a duration of one day and one month. If we want to add this onto January 1st, we need to define a new variable as this is actually immutable. So we say January 1st dot add and then our duration and our new value add time is equal to the 2nd of February. We can do the same thing with the subtract time here. As you can see, we do January 1st dot subtract and then the duration. You can also pass the duration inline using the object or string syntax, but we're gonna leave it like this. And you can see we end up with the 30th of November. And as I said, if we console log out January 1st now to string after doing these calculations, it still has the same value that it originally had. 
This was somewhat of a tripping up point in the JavaScript date object. As you can see down here, if I have a date of the 1st of January here, and then I say old.setMonth, old.getMonth plus one, so add one month on. When we go ahead and then we console log out the old value, it's actually changed the original reference. There were ways of working around this, but this new syntax is just way cleaner. Some other cool methods that we have around duration are until and since. These actually create durations for you. If I have two dates, say January 1st and 31st, I can simply say January 1st dot until January 31st. As you can see, that returns a temporal dot duration. And then if I print that out to a string, we get a period of 30 days. I can do the same thing, but the other way around. I can say January 31st and then the amount of time since January 1st. And you can see I'm also going to get that period of 30 days. Another really cool thing that we can do with a duration though, is we can get a specific amount of units. So say if I wanted to get the amount of seconds that are in 30 days, I can simply take the duration. So in this case, since I can then say total, and then I can provide it with the unit that I want. Obviously you can see there's a load of options. If I go ahead and choose second, you can see we end up with a load of seconds, which is the amount of seconds in 30 days. Two more cool choices that we have on durations is we can go ahead and negate the duration. So if I do since dot negated here, and then if I go ahead and log this out to a string, you can see we're gonna end up with the negative version of that duration, so minus 30 days. But then we could also go ahead and get the absolute value out as well. So if I do dot negated dot absolute, this is gonna essentially undo what we just did. And you can see we get back the absolute value of 30 days. There's a few more things I wanna show you that you can do with temporal as it just shows off how powerful it is. The first one is rounding here. So we have a date time that is 3.30, 45 seconds, and then a load of milliseconds. We can go ahead and round this time with a load of options. So all we need to do is say rounded time, we take the date time dot round, then we can say our smallest unit. So in this case, we want it to be a minute. Then we can also choose the rounding mode as well. In this case, I'm gonna choose ceiling. So you can see the value that we end up getting out is it's gonna be 3.31 as it's rounded up for us. Then we can also round to a increment. So we round to five. You can see we can do date time dot round, provide a rounding increment of five. Again, smallest unit minute. And then I've set the rounding mode to floor this time. And you can see we actually end up with 3.30 as it's rounded it down to the nearest five minutes. You actually see there's a load of different rounding mode options. You have things like ceiling, floor, expand, truncate, half ceiling, half floor, loads of them. Pretty much anything you want to do with rounding, temporal has you covered. Temporal also gives us comparison functions. So here I have two plain times. This will work with any temporal type though. And if I want to compare them, I can say temporal.planeTime.compare and then pass in time one and time two. It's gonna return minus one if time one comes before time two, zero if they are the same, and then one if time one comes after time two. So if you wanted to check if they were equal, you could go ahead and compare them and see if it equals zero, or we can simply go ahead and use time one dot equals time two or the other way around. There we go. That is everything you need to get started with temporal. There's even more you could try though, like the two JSON methods, calendars, time zone, and so much more. I'll leave a link to the proposal in the description down below. Hopefully you can see the world where we can remove moment, luxon, or date functions, and we can simply just use the JavaScript language instead. I'm looking forward to that. Let me know if you are in the comments down below. While you're there, subscribe, and as always, see you in the next one.